Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Tuesday Night Sunlight Service. This is a Covenant God Part 3. And again, our, our main focus for this uh, sermon series is to really look at the New Covenant and understand that we, we don't have a God who is necessarily beholden to a covenant, but we have a God who is the New Covenant. Jesus is the New Covenant. It's His blood and, and, and as we're going to see tonight, it, it's His cup that, that really truly is the New Covenant. So when we're talking about the New Covenant, we're not talking about something for man to do. We're talking about something that man is because of the God that lives inside man, which is who Jesus was. Jesus, when He walked the earth, He was literally God in the flesh, love in a body. And again, when He gave us that same Spirit, that now has made us that same Jesus, that same body of Christ, who, who now love lives in our body, now God lives in our flesh. So again, that's, that's the, biggest, uh, the biggest shift or change that took place from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, which, which we really kind of looked at last week where, you know, the, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The only thing the Law of Moses or the Old Covenant could do was point out your sins without doing anything to help you overcome those sins. It demanded perfection without being able to produce perfection, and all it could do was kill you. All it could do was condemn you. And then when we got to the, the Spirit, that get, that's what gives you life. And, and again, that's what the New Covenant is. It's that abundant life that, that not only comes from Jesus, but that abundant life that is Jesus. So again, tonight we're going to look at the cup. And I almost say that hesitantly because... This is not the, the whole, this is not the cup from A to Z. I'm just looking at one aspect of it tonight. And I'm skipping Jesus' prayer where, you know, where he prays for the cup to pass from him. Because I could do a whole sermon on that all by itself. But I want to show something here that God was showing me that I, that I think is, is really cool. And hopefully that, that will, once again, you know, just help us to identify with him. So our key verse is Luke 22, verse 20. And I'm going to read it in. The Weymouth translation, and it says, He gave them the cup in like manner when the meal was over. This cup, he said, is the new covenant ratified my, by my blood, which is to be poured out on your behalf. So again, you know, I, I always talk about, when I talk about the new covenant, I talk about how the new covenant is the blood of Christ. But really what Jesus technically said, he said this cup is the new covenant. So that's why I thought it was important to, to really kind of dig in a little bit and see what, what was he really speaking about when he said this cup is the new covenant. And, and one of the first things we're going to see is that the, the cup is, is really, it's the vessel, it's, it's the body, it's what holds the blood inside of it, which, is, which to me is really cool because that means the new covenant, which is Jesus, is us. Because we are the vessel that holds the blood of Christ inside of us. We are the cup that holds his blood. And, and, and when he said, uh, ratified by my blood, which is to be poured out on your behalf, he didn't just pour it out on our behalf, he poured it in on our behalf. He, he poured it out of himself, but he poured it into us. He brought us out of bondage, he brought us out of Egypt, and he brought us in to the promised land. Because it seems like so many times we spend so much attention on, on, on what we're getting away from, of what we're turning away from, of, of, of what we have conquered, or, or sometimes what we're trying to conquer, even though, you know, eternally speaking, we have conquered it because Jesus conquered it on the cross. But we spend so much time and so much attention and so much focus on the stuff that we're trying to get free from that we almost miss out on what we've been freed to. And I think it's so important for us to understand that He didn't just, again, He didn't just pour His blood out for us. He poured his blood into us. So, so when we're talking about, again, this cup that is the new covenant, that's us. That's the body. That's the vessel. And we're going to see that uh, really in clear detail in our first passage tonight in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And, and this is a ver there's a verse in here that, uh, that I think I kind of grabbed for many times, but today we're going to read it in context and we're really going to look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 starting with verse 1. And it's really interesting to me, I'm going to read it in the King James in the message, but the, uh, the heading in the Message Bible for 2 Corinthians 4 is, 
trial and torture. And to me that was very kind of an interesting, uh, interesting heading for this because when we come to the New Covenant, we're not talking about trial, we're talking about the judgment that came from the trial, as it were, that took place on the cross. And, and really what we're going to see here is when it comes to our personal trials, what we do is we identify with Christ. When we have to, again, when we think we have to overcome something, how we do that, Revelation, the book of Revelation says, we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It doesn't say we will overcome. It doesn't say this is how we overcome. It says we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And again, when, when we really start to break this down, we see that our testimony is His testimony. Because He didn't just die for us, He died as us. So, so really, what testimony could possibly matter more than, as he is, so are we in this world? What testimony could possibly, what, what have we gone through that, that could possibly live up to Jesus literally dying on a cross and giving his life for his friends? So this trial and this torture that we're looking at here, it's not something that we have to face, or, 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 or in fact, if we do have to face it, it's not something that we're facing alone, and we're, it's not something we're facing so that we can conquer it. It's something that has already been dealt with, already taken care of. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting with the first verse, in the King James Version it reads, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received, mercy, we faint not. Mercy allows you to really be in a, in a posture or a position to receive. Because when you understand God's mercy, you understand that there's nothing holding you back from receiving. When you understand God's forgiveness, you understand that there's nothing that, that's in your past, your present, or your future that would disqualify you from receiving. So this ministry, we, it, we don't faint in our ministry, which again, our ministry is, is the ministry of reconciliation. Our ministry is to be loved and to love. We don't faint there because we have received mercy. Because we have received from the Father, we can then give what it is that we have received. We can release it. We can share it. And again, that's the whole point. To me, that's the whole point of everything. That's our epic destiny. That's our eternal purpose in Christ, is, is simply to be loved and to love each other with that same love. And then it says, We faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And again, you know, what happens when the truth manifests? Jesus manifests, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. So when we're talking about truth, we're not talking about just saying something. We're talking about, you know, again, we're talking about personifying something. We're talking about a lifestyle. We're talking about not just what we do, but who we are. If he is the truth, and if, you know, as he is, so are we in this world, that means we are the truth. And that's what I'm really trying to say tonight is, if it's true about Jesus, it's true about you. Because you're in Him because He's in you. So this new covenant, the, the cup, that's us. We are the new covenant, ratified or uh, yeah, ratified by His blood. His blood thrown, flowing through our veins is what makes the new covenant you know, real f for us. Because it's not, again, it's not something that we do or it's not something that, that even that we really take part in, but it's who we are. And again, that's, that's about the, the truth manifesting. Verse 3, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. So, so, here's what I get from those verses, is if you're dealing with an unbeliever, give him a break. Don't try to choke him with the truth, just manifest the truth. Don't say, you have to love or you're not going to be accepted by God. Instead, say, God accepts you, God loves you, I love you, and now that you've been filled with something, now that you've been given something, now that you've been shown a more excellent way, I'm not putting a yoke on you, I'm, I'm opening up a whole world for you. Now that you know that you're loved, now you can love. Love doesn't work as a, as a condition. Love doesn't work as a have to. If you say I have to do something, you know, uh, something usually rises up in me and it says, oh really, I have to do this? We'll see about that. But if instead, if I give you something, 
Now you don't have to do anything. Now, when you get so full of what it is that I'm giving you, when you get so full of the love of Christ, now you don't have to love or else. Now you have to love because it's so full that it just comes out naturally. And that's the way that this whole thing really works. It doesn't work on a, I have to do this or else basis. That was the old covenant. That's not the new covenant. That's not the cup that has been filled with the blood of Christ. And then again, that's what it says in verse 5. It says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, who are servants for Jesus' sake. We preach Jesus by being each other's servants. Even in the same way that Jesus got down on his knees and washed his disciples' feet. He didn't take the place of honor. He took the place of service. He didn't make others, you know, uh, grovel and come to him and, and pay him, you know, all these different adoration and respect and all these things. People still did that. But he didn't demand that from them. He did what he did out of love. He washed his disciples' feet because he loved them and he wanted them to be clean. And in the same way, when we really start to understand this connection with each other that is called love, then, then we will have that same heart. And, and really, we, we have that same heart. And it's the circumcision made without hands, the cutting the way of the flesh, the cutting away of our human effort that, that reveals that heart in ourselves and to one another. That, that we get to the place where now it's not about I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. Now it's about if your back is just I'll scratch it for you because I love you. And it comes from a, a place of I, I don't need anything from you. I have what I need. So let me give you what I have. And then it says in verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Why does the light shine? The light does not shine to change things. The light shines to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light shines to reveal things. The light shines to show us Jesus. To show us who we truly are by showing us who He truly, truly is. The knowledge of Him. That's why Jesus, even when He said, you know, when He said, If you're tired and weary, come to me. He said, take my yoke upon you. He said, learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When, when we have this knowledge of Jesus, and I'm not talking about a book knowledge. I'm not talking about what other people think about Jesus' knowledge. I'm talking about when we have this experiential knowledge of who he is. When we know the Father in the context of, I am his beloved Son in whom he is well pleased. That's when the light is shining. And when the light shines in you, it, it, it shines out of you. In the same way, again, Jesus poured his blood out. And he poured it in, and now again, once it's in there, it comes out of there. We are the spout where the glory comes out. But if we don't know and believe that there's glory in there, then there's no glory that's going to come out of there. So again, that comes from knowledge. It comes from the knowledge of Jesus. It comes from the knowledge of the finished work. It comes from knowing him as we are known by him. It comes from that relationship, that unity, again, that, that can only come from love. So when we think about these things, it's not about, you know, you know, I read the Bible more than you, so I have more knowledge of Jesus. Because Jesus, he, he even condemned that. He said, you search the scriptures because you think there's life in them, but the scriptures speak about me. I'm right here. I'm talking to you. I'm hanging out with you. I'm interacting with you. I'm connecting with you. I'm having a relationship with you. And you're missing it, you know, like, like again, like the story of, of the, the two women, uh, Mary and Martha, I think. I didn't look this one up. God just kind of dropped this one on me. But one of them was running around trying to get the, the, the party ready, and the other one was sitting at Jesus' feet, learning of him, and experiencing him, and, and connecting with him. And, and the one who was running around like crazy was like, come on, can, can I get some help here or what? And Jesus said, no, she's chosen the better thing. It's not about all your deeds. It's not about pleasing God through your actions. It's just simply about spending time with him. It's just simply about knowing him, knowing his heart. You know, putting your, your head on, 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 his, on his breast so you can hear his heartbeat. It's just about understanding that he loves you and he wants to take care of you. And, and when you know that, and I'm talking about when you know that, then all this other stuff, it just really, it just fades away. Because you know, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got it taken care of. 2,000 years ago on the cross, he handled every situation that you would ever need to face. And now when we face that situation, what do we do? We manifest the truth. We just bring forth from within what he has put within. So, 
Again, that's that's to me, that's that's what the light does. It doesn't change your situation, but it reveals your situation as it truly is. It shows you how things have been placed in divine order. And then verse 7 is where I wanted to get, because this is the one that really kind of brings us back to, to the idea of the cup being the vessel. We are the cup, we are the vessel, filled with the precious blood of Christ that he poured out for us and poured in to us. Verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 4 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So, so, and I love the next couple of verses, we're going to read them in a second, but this is where everything comes from, the treasure in the earthen vessel, the inner man, the spirit that dwells within us, God in the flesh, love in a body, it all comes from what's within, because what's within is, is what comes out, and we're going to look at that again in a second too. But now that we understand this, now that the light has shined in our hearts, now that we have some, some knowledge of who Jesus is and what he did, and, and more importantly, who Jesus is in us, and what he has done in us, and what he is doing through us, now we get to the place where, in verse 8 it says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. So again, how does the life, how is the life of Jesus made manifest in our body? Because we carry his death, because we understand the cross, because we understand that first he had to be crucified, he had to die, he had to be buried, and then because of that sacrifice that he made for us and as us, out of that death springs forth his life. And, and, and again, the next six steps to the throne, the first three are crucified, died, buried, and then the next three are quickened, raised, and seated. But you can't have the last three until you understand the first three. You can't identify with his life until you identify with his death. Because his death was your death. And if you're trying to fit an abundant life into an old man, it doesn't fit. If you're trying to put new wine into an old wineskin, it's gonna, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna crack and the wine's gonna spill out and it's not gonna fit. If you try to add uh, a little bit of law and a little bit of grace, if you try to have that mixture, it's not gonna fit. It doesn't work. It's a new cup, a new covenant filled with new blood. It's all about Jesus, which, uh, which I guess I can skip ahead a little bit because this fits here. Stay here in Second Corinthians, but I want to read. In the next verse in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this is the point of the new covenant. We saw last week that, that with the change of a priesthood, by necessity, there was a change of the law. And it's no longer a law that condemns, but it's a perfect law of liberty. It's, it's the law of life in the Spirit. It's totally and completely new. You are totally and completely new. You've been given a new body. You've been given a new heaven, a new earth. Old things have passed away. All of that old stuff is gone. It's dead and gone and it's buried. That old man that you used to identify with, whose name is Adam, you're not in Adam anymore. You're not connected to Adam anymore. He died on the cross. And, and, and you know, again, naturally he died, you know, thousands of years ago, but... But spiritually speaking, he died on the cross when Jesus became who we were and died so that when he came back to life, we could become who he is and live. And that's, again, that's the whole point of the new covenant. The new covenant is not about your sins because they've been forgiven and forgotten and taken away. The new covenant is about life. And, and I think next week we're really going to focus in on the blood. But, but what's so important about the blood, it, biblically speaking, is, is the blood is where the life is. So this cup, this vessel, it, it really doesn't mean a whole lot until it's filled with something, until it's filled with the precious blood of Christ. And again, that's what he did. He gave us a new body. He gave us also a new mind. He gave us the new cup. He gave us the new blood. He gave us the new wineskin. He gave us the new wine. He made everything new in our lives. That's why the Bible speaks of walking in newness of life. Which doesn't just mean you have a reset and you get to try your old life over again. It means you have a new life where everything is different. Everything has changed. 
Everything now is just Jesus. Because again, that's who we are. That's who lives in us. That's who we live in. You know, I believe it's in the book of Acts. It says, in him we live and move and have our being. And I always include the flip side of that. In us, he lives and moves and has his being. So again, it's this unity, it's this love, it's this relationship where, where we walk together because he's walking in our feet. So let's look at this in the Message Bible. 2 Corinthians 4, starting with verse 1, and it says, Since God has so generously let us in on what he is doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. And we don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display, so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. And, and here's the deal. People are going to judge you no matter what. People are going to judge you if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian. So if people are going to look at your life anyway, you know, really the safest thing you can do is, is manifest the truth. Is just to be open and honest. To just simply be who you are. Don't try to be somebody who you think the world will accept or who you think God will accept. Just simply understand who He is in you and you'll understand who you are in Him. And then you can just be yourself. And, and, and really I feel like that's one of the biggest parts of my message is, I, listen, God just wants you to be yourself. So that's why it's so important that we find out who we really are, which as we saw last week, I think it was last week, we, what we saw was we are God's love letter to the world. We are how God expresses himself to the world, and God is love. So when he expresses himself to the world, he expresses love to the world. And how he does that is he does it through us. So, so when I say be yourself, all I simply mean is, is just love as you are loved. Love one another as Jesus loves you. That's the new commandment that goes with the new covenant. So it goes on in verses 3 and 4, and moving on it says, If our message is obscure to anyone, it's not because we're holding back in any way. No, it's because these other people are looking or going the wrong way and refuse to give it serious attention. All they have eyes for is the fashionable God of darkness. They think he can give them what they want and that they won't have to bother believing a truth they can't see. They're stone blind to the day spring brightness of the message that shines with Christ, who gives us the best picture of God we'll ever get. And again, listen, if somebody doesn't accept your message, that's okay. You don't have to convince people that God is who he says he is. God will do that all by himself. You know, when, when, when Saul of Tarsus was, was riding on his donkey and, and, and God wanted to get him, God knocked him off his donkey all by himself. And he convinced Paul all by himself. And he gave Paul revelation all by himself. And he changed Paul's name or his nature all by himself. God does not need us to do that for him. What God wants us to do for him, and, and, and when I say for him, I don't mean, you know, he's telling us to do this. I, I mean as him. What he wants us to do for him and as him is, is to manifest the truth, to love, to show people who he is by loving people. And if they don't want to accept your love, that's okay. Because again, what you're not loving them to get something from them. You're loving them because you have something from the God who is love. So it goes on in verses 5 and 6, and it says, Remember, our message is not about ourselves. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ the Master. And if you're loving somebody so you can get something from them, then you've made the message about yourself. You've made the message about what you can get instead of what you can give. And you know, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave. So, so love is giving, it's not getting. So if you're focused on what you can get out of it, then you've missed the message. And, and, and again, you can't give it if you don't have it. So, so again, we saw, I think it was last week, about being able ministers of the, the new covenant. That comes from first receiving the new covenant. That comes from releasing what you have rather than trying to get something, rather than trying to earn something. Rather than trying to do in order to be, instead we, we do because we be. We, we don't love in order to get love. We love because we are loved. And again, that's the focus. So he says, remember, our message is not about ourselves. We are proclaiming Jesus Christ, the Master. 
All we are is messengers, errand runners from Jesus for you. It started when God said, light up the darkness, and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. So again, when, when we're faced with anything, it's not about, I have to conquer this. It's not about my strength. It's not about me at all. It's about identifying with Jesus, who has already conquered. You know, again, Jesus said, you know, you'll face trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So if he's already overcome the world, and now he lives in us, that means by that identification, by that unification, then that means that we have already overcome the world. So, so as Hebrews says, you know, it, everything is already under our feet. And we don't always see it under our feet, but we see Jesus. And if we see Jesus, then, we, then we're there. And the more we see him, the more we will manifest where we are, the more we will understand where we are. The more we see him, the more we will see it under our feet, because the more we will understand really what he accomplished on the cross. We will under, understand again that... that the, the new covenant, the new cup, the new wine is a totally new creation, a totally new creature in Him because He's in us. So now let's go to Matthew 23. And this is the one, this is, uh, I hope that that last uh, passage leads into this one because this is really our key verse for today when we're talking about the cup. What we're going to see in Matthew 23 verses 25 through 28. And this is Jesus speaking, and in the King James it reads, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So when we, what we see is when we're talking about the cup, what is important about the cup is what's inside. It's not about which cup looks the best. It's not about which guy looks the most righteous. It's not about, you know, having, having this, this beautiful sepulcher, which, which is, again, which is full of dead man's bones. It's not about what's on the outside. It's not about that outward man. It's about what's inside. And again, you know, he, when he's speaking, you know, before the law, when he's speaking before the cross and he's, he's telling people to clean what's inside, that's what he did on the cross. He cleaned our inside. He, he, he gave us that, uh, that blood transfusion, as it were, that heart transplant, as it were, where he cleaned out what was inside so that what was outside even would be clean. He did all of the work to perfect us, to present us to himself as a bride without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. So, so again, you know, if you're, try, if you're looking in, in the mirror with a natural face, if you're looking at the mirror through, through the law or through the veil of the law, and you see all these spots, you're going to act like somebody who has spots because that's what you see, that's what you believe about yourself. But if you look into the mirror with an unveiled face, if you, if you can understand that Jesus fulfilled the law and he hung it to the cross because it was obsolete and because it was contrary to us, because it was against us, because it was condemning us, if you can see that that stone has been rolled out of the way and you can look into the mirror with an unveiled face, you'll see the glory of God in the mirror. Not because God's in the mirror, but because God's in you. And when you see that, that He presented you to Himself without spots, then you'll stop acting like you have spots. Then you'll stop focusing on spots. Then you'll stop trying to get rid of spots because you'll see He did the work. And now I get to enjoy the fruit of His labor. 
And the fruit of his labor is the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. So now that I can quit looking at myself and saying, well, God couldn't possibly love me because of this spot and this spot and this spot, but instead I can look in the mirror and I don't see any spots, then I can say, of course he loves me because he's my dad and I'm his son. Of course he loves me because I'm his. That's why he did everything to, 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 to reconcile us to himself. We were enemies in our minds because of our wicked deeds, but even when we were sinners, even when we were unbelievers, even when we were running away from his presence, he still died for us. And that's how he showed us his love for us. And again, we're going to look at that in a second. Because there, there's a big aspect of, of how Jesus you know, got, got rid of the old cup, as it were. How, how he drank what was in the old cup, as it were, in order to be able to have a new cup. In order to be able to fill us with, with his blood. So we're going to look at that in just a second. But I want to read this in the Message Bible first. Matthew 23, starting with verse 25, it reads in the Message Bible, Jesus says, You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You burnish the surface of your cups and bowls so they sparkle in the sun, while the insides are maggoty with your greed and gluttony. Stupid Pharisee, scour the insides, and then the gleaming surface will mean something. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees, Frauds, you're like manicured gray plots, grass clipped and the flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. People look at you and think you're saints, but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. And again, this is so important. That's why Jesus died and was buried and rose again. That's why we understand that, that uh, our sepulcher, as it were, it's not filled with dead man's bones, it's empty. There's no death in us. There's no darkness in us. There's simply Jesus living in us. And, and, and again, you know, we're not rotting bones anymore. We're, we're, not, we're not sinners anymore. We're saints. We're, we're, we're alive. His blood flows through our veins. His blood comes from God's heart in our chest beating with love. So, so, so what's inside is what matters because what's inside is what comes out. It's not, it's not from the outside in, it's from the inside out. So it doesn't matter how, how, how much you try to make an old man behave. An old man is dead. And he needs to just stay buried so the new man can rise forth. And if you're caught in the struggle where, where you think your old man is rising up, guys, your old man is not rising up. He's dead and he's gone and he's buried. You're dead and your life is hid in Christ. So when we understand that shift that has taken place, when we understand the new covenant that we're in, that doesn't deal with the old man, that doesn't deal with, with, with any more cleaning and washing, because, you know, again, Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice, and no more sacrifice is needed. He cleansed us, he perfected us forever. You know, listen, even when you mess up, you're still the righteousness of God in Christ. You're just simply the righteousness of God in Christ who messed up. So, so again, as we learn more of who we are, I, I'm convinced that, that those mess-ups will be, you know, less frequent as we begin to, again, manifest the truth, as we stop trying to walk this out in our own strength, but instead we just simply walk in our identity, we simply walk in the truth of who we are, we just, we, we simply focus on the inner man, which again, the, the, the Bible speaks in another place about being strengthened in the inner man, so, so that we can know Him, so that we can know that we are Him, so that we can be who we are as we let Him be Himself in us. So, so again, I hope we are seeing here that, that the, the, the cup, the vessel, what's important about it is what's inside of it. And, and again, what's inside of it is, is the, the new wine or the, or the blood of Christ. And now I want to talk just for, just for a minute about... Uh, Again, the identification with Jesus, the idea that uh, what he did in order to, to cleanse the cup or clean the cup or, or give us the new cup, as it were. So, let's go to Matthew chapter 20, and I want to read verses 22 and 23. And in the King James, Matthew 20, verse 22 reads, But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. 
And again, these are the disciples who, who wanted to sit at his right hand and at his left hand. These are the ones who wanted the best place. These are the ones who, who wanted the glory and the self-righteousness for themselves. And Jesus said, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Whatever it takes to get the top spot, we got this. Because they again, that's that carnal mindset of doing in order to be, of earning something. And then in verse 23 it says, he, And he saith unto them, Ye shall indeed drink, ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. So Jesus said, first Jesus asked, Can, can you drink of this cup that I'm going to drink of? And they said, Yeah, yeah, we can do it. And he said, Listen, you're going to drink of it. But it's not going to get you the result that you think it is. It, you're not doing it for the reason that you think you're doing it. There's something else at play here. There's something much bigger here than you doing something in order to get something. And what we're going to see, you know, again, is, is, is we drank the cup when he drank the cup. He became us and did what was necessary so that we could become him. He totally identified with us and, and died so that we could die. And then when he rose again to life, you know, now we can totally identify with him. He did it all. He finished the work. And that's what, again, that's what we're going to see in, in just a second. But, uh, but first I want to go to Psalm 75, verse 8. And it says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. And there's a lot here, talking about, again, talking about the wine, I mean, the, the, the red wine, which, which is his blood, talking about it being, talking about him pouring it out for us. And then the dregs, or what's left over, it says, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. Now, now watch this. That phrase, it, it is full of mixture, that alluded to, the medicated wine or potion of stupefying drugs given to criminals to drink previous to their executions. So again, we're not talking about about something, we're not talking about punishment here. We're talking about wicked or, or, or wickedness that had to die, and we're talking about God basically giving medicine to those that, that were condemned to die, as it were, in, in order to ease their suffering. And we're going to see that manifest in, 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 in fullness in just a second on the cross. Uh, in the Message Bible it reads like this, it says, God has a cup in his hand, a bowl of wine, full to the brim. He draws from it and pours, it's drained to the dregs. Earth's wicked ones drink it all, drink it down to the last bitter drop. So again, what we saw was, was the disciples you know, asking Jesus for, for something special. And then him asking them, if, if, if can you go through what I'm going to go through? Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? And them saying, yeah, we can do it, so we can earn our reward. And Jesus saying, you will do it, but, but not for the reason you think you're going to do it, not in the manner you think you're going to do it. And then we see here that, that again, it, it's the wicked ones that, that shall drink all of the cup. So then we fast forward to, back to Luke 22. And I'm actually going to read verses 17 through 20, which brings us back to our key verse in, uh, in Luke 22, starting with verse 17. In the King James it reads, And he, being Jesus, took the cup and gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So, the key here, which, which again brought it right around back to where we started here, was Jesus said, Here, I'm not going to drink from this cup until the kingdom of God comes. He said, this, this, this cup that we're talking about, this drinking of this cup that, that we just saw in Psalms, that, that the wicked would drink of it, this is how Jesus was saying, this is how 
the kingdom will be established. When I, I'm not drinking this cup again until the kingdom comes. The next time I drink from a cup, the next time I drink this wine, is when the kingdom will come. When the kingdom will be established. This is how Jesus was establishing the kingdom, or the new covenant, or, or, or again, the new creature, whatever you want to call it. Which takes us to John chapter 19. And this is where I'm going to end for tonight. John 19, verses 29 and 30. In the King James it reads, Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So what we see here is Jesus, on the cross, condemned to die, was given this same mixture that was spoken of in Psalm 75, 8. Jesus was given the wine that was that 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 was prophesied to be to be drank to the last drop by the wicked man, which which again which simply means that Jesus became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Jesus totally and completely identified with us. He was lifted up from the earth. He was lifted up on the cross. He drew all men into himself. He drew all of our wickedness into our, onto himself. He drew all of our iniquity, all of our sin into himself. He became who we were, and he drank that cup both for us and as us. So, so in the exact same, just like he told the disciples, he said, you will drink of the same cup that I'm drinking of. But again, he didn't make them drink it. They drank it when he drank it. They drank it. Because they were in Him. He, he, he did it all for us and as us. He completely identified with us. He drank the wine again. This is the next instance after He said, I'm not going to drink wine until the kingdom comes. This is the next time He drinks that wine. This is when the kingdom came. When He said, it is finished. When He gave up the ghost. When He died on the cross and, and, and again three days later rose again. That's when the kingdom came. That's when everything that was prophesied came to pass. That's when the promise of God to, to you know, again, the very first covenant that, that he made with Noah, where he said, I'm going to wash away the wickedness of the world, but I'm going to put you in the ark. That's when this came into full uh, fulfillment. That's when this came into fullness. That's when it totally and completely manifested, is, is, is when Jesus became that wicked man. He became Adam, so to speak, and he drank from that cup as a condemned man, who, who again, was getting that, that medicated why he was getting that uh, he was getting that mercy he was getting that you know uh, uh, pain management as it were before he died so that he could establish this new kingdom so that he could uh, establish this new covenant so that he could give us a new wine he took what was necessary both for us and as us which means we took it which means when he died again which means we died so that when he rose again so that we could live. And, and I even like it better in the Message Bible in John 19 uh, verses 29 and 30 it says, A jug of sour wine was standing by. Someone put a sponge soaked with the wine on a javelin and lifted it to his mouth. After he took the wine, Jesus said, It's done. Complete. Bowing his head, he offered up his spirit. So again, this, this man who is condemned by man, not by God, this man who is condemned by other men, he laid his life down. He offered up his spirit. He took what we needed in order to give us something even better. He took what was, what was given for us. Because again, you know, we, we were already dead, really. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And then when Jesus became who we were and died, that was the second death that allowed for a new birth. That's what brought us out of the old and into the new. That's what brought us out of bondage and into the promised land. That's when he poured his life out for us and, and poured his life into us. Or, or again, poured his blood out for us and poured his blood into us. It, it, it all came from, from drinking from that cup. It all came from him drinking, at, again, as the wicked man, totally and completely identifying us with us for the first three steps, crucified, died, and buried. When he was crucified, he drew us into himself. When he died, we died. When he was buried, our old man was buried. And then after that, because the kingdom had, was established with, with him drinking that wine again, he said, I'm not going to drink wine again until the kingdom comes. So the next time he drinks it, we know that the kingdom came. And then when that happened, the next three steps to the throne, we, he was quickened, 
or brought back to life. We, so were we. He was raised up to the right hand of God, to the throne of God. So were we. And he was seated on the throne, in the throne. He is the throne. And so were we. So, so again, we carry his death so that we might enjoy his life. We identify with the first three steps so that we can identify with, with the last three steps. He did everything that needed to be done for us and as us so, so that in a sense we could do everything that needed to be done. We did drink from the same cup he did. We were baptized with the same baptism that he was baptized with, but, but not, to get the best, not, not, not to get the best seat for ourselves, but to enjoy the best seat in him. Because Jesus is, is, is the one, again, he, Jesus spoke of himself when, when he said, it's not for me to give you know, the, the, the best place at my, at my Father's right hand or his left hand. That's where Jesus is seated now, presently, at the right hand of the Father in the throne of God. So that's where we are. So we got there, but not through our own effort, but through his effort. We got there not by what we do, but by identifying with him. We got there not by not not by you know not by might or by power, but by the Spirit of God. We didn't get there through following rules. We got there through the Spirit, which gives life. It's not about laws you keep. It's about a life that keeps you. And, and again, that's what this cup is all about. It, it, it's this vessel that holds the blood. It's it, 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 it's this this God in the flesh, in our flesh. So that's what I have for this week. Uh, again, this is not an exhaustive study of, uh, of every reference of cup in the Bible because there's a really cool story, I believe it's in Exodus, where, where there's a silver cup uh, which speaks of redemption, which, which all ties into this, but again, there's, you know, there's too much. I didn't even speak, again, to, to Gethsemane, but, but I, just, I hope we understand that, that the new covenant is God in us. It's Jesus. It's God in the flesh. That's who we are because that's who He is in us. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I love you. Amen.